Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's BU Industry Insiders webinar, Cognitive Computing, the Next Revolution in Data Analytics and Knowledge Management. My name is Jeff Murphy. I'm Associate Director in the BU Alumni Relations Office, as well as a proud alumnus of the BU Questrom School of Business. Today's webinar is sponsored by the BU Alumni Association and is the first in this new series. With BU Industry Insiders, the Alumni Association highlights successful alumni thought leaders showcasing their work on emerging trends and advancements in fields that Terriers work in. It's important that we get your opinion on how we're doing, so we very much look forward to receiving your feedback via a short survey that will be emailed to all of you later today. Please know that we really do value your opinion on this program and everything that we offer. Before I introduce today's speaker, some brief housekeeping notes. As you know by now, this webinar is being hosted on the Adobe Connect online meeting platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of this presentation, I'll ask that you please contact Adobe Connect directly, and you can reach them by phone at 1-800-422-3623. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the BU Alumni Association website, which you can find at www.bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions you may have, and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A chat box that you should see located at the bottom of your screen. We hope to get to as many questions as we can during today's webinar. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day. Presenting from her office in Needham, Massachusetts is BU College of Arts and Sciences and College of Communication alumna Judith Hurwitz. Judith is president and CEO of Hurwitz & Associates LLC, a research and consulting firm focused on emerging technology, including big data, cognitive computing, cloud computing, service management, software development, and security and governance. She's a technology strategist, thought leader, and author of eight books, including Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics and Smarter Lucky, How Technology Leaders Turn Chance into Success. Judith is a two-time Terrier, earning both her bachelor's and master's degrees from BU. She serves on several advisory boards of emerging companies and is also a board member of the Boston University Alumni Council, where I've enjoyed the opportunity to work with her on one of the committees that she serves on. She received the College of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Alumni Award back in 2005 and in the same year was awarded the Massachusetts, Te Massachusetts Technology Leadership Council Award. Judith, thank you again for being with us today. Thank you for all that you do for BU. And I'll go ahead and get your slides up and then the floor is all yours very much. So it's, uh, it's great to be here today. Um, I, I've been uh, very active in BU, so it's uh, very exciting to be able to help launch this new series uh, of webinars. So before we uh, get started, um, I, would, I have a question that I would like to, uh, to get you to vote on. And the question is, why are you interested in cognitive computing? So as you see, there are, uh, should be on your screen, a list of several choices. It's important emerging technology. It has a major implication for the industry I work in. I'm interested in job opportunities. I want to um, uh, expand my own knowledge. And I'm very well versed in the topic already. And there's nothing else that you could tell me. So that's what uh, if you will just uh, pull your answers. Um, Excellent. So I think I think that basically we are seeing that uh, it has uh, it seems to be between uh, wanting some general knowledge and understanding that it is going to uh, impact um, the industries that uh, that many of you are working in. So I think with with that we can uh, we can move on to uh, the um, the beginning of my presentation. Okay, so um, cognitive computing is really, I would define it as the next generation of computing. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about what it is, where has this come from, where has it come from, what are the foundational elements, and how cognitive computing is, is really being used in many different industries, and what is the future going to look like. So when I look at technology transitions, and, and I think that if, if, we th if we think about this, every, every technology that comes along does not come out of nothing. It is basically can take decades for a technology to emerge that, that really is transformative. So, so there are three key principles that are at play here. 
first of all, these revolutionary technologies such as cognitive computing will take decades to evolve. Then dramatic changes happen as this technology matures enough to become ubiquitous. It's changes in the underlying platforms, technology, a lot of different things have to come together. And when these technology transitions happen, they really can absolutely revolutionize industry. So the bottom line is that when these three principles converge, revolutions happen. So what is cognitive computing? Well, it is the ability for humans and machines to collaborate, to analyze huge amounts of data and correlate that data in, in order to come up with new insights. So cognitive computing is really about solving problems. It uses hardware, it uses software, it uses cloud. And the intent is to really begin to leverage the functions of natural cognitive processes that we, that we all take for granted. So why, why are we talking about cognitive computing? So what's wrong with our traditional computing models? Well, if any of you have ever been involved in any type of software development or even been the recipient of software, you know that programs are built with a set of logic based on how we uh, conduct processes um, uh, within our businesses. So typically, traditional systems are based on the way we think about our world in the past. And by time these systems are done, they, they are assuming an outcome uh, based on how things have always worked in the past. So we're always playing catch up when, when we have applications. Because as we all know, businesses are going through revolutions every day. And if we stick with traditional models, we basically will be run over. So how is cognitive computing different? Well, first of all, it, it, rather than building logic first, it's based on data and letting the data lead us to conclusions, which is very different than how we've ever thought about computing in the past. So a cognitive computing system actually will learn from patterns in data and from anomalies in data. To, to create a cognitive system, one actually, uh, a data scientist actually creates a model or representation of the domain in order to understand the context of a specific problem. So what, what is even more important is that cognitive system does not assume that there is going to be one correct answer. It assumes, so, so it's really probabilistic. It uses a hypothesis based on what the data is, is, is explaining and it may actually change that answer and change those suggestions based on new data being introduced and new hypotheses that are being generated. So in a sense, even if you're not in the computer industry, you can understand that cognitive computing is really designed based on how the brain works. So how do we learn? We learn from how we observe the world and we, we collect lots of data, we get feedback uh, from that data, we observe, we reinforce, and we are motivated by what happens. If, if a child puts, puts his or her hand into a fire and gets burned, then that child will, will begin to learn that putting one's hand into a flame is, is not a good thing, and will be actually motivated in the future not to put one's hand in a fire. So the, it, it really is amazing to think about how this human brain is an amazing system of systems that is very difficult to, to replicate. In fact, there, there are some people in the industry who are, are working with both hardware and software to, to try to, to replicate how the brain works. So we learn from experience. We learn for how we perceive the world. If, uh, if, if somebody is walking um, in the woods and sees that leaves are brown and falling off the trees, 
then we perceive that the seasons are changing. And we remember that, um, that last year it did the same thing. So we reason, we, we develop um, concepts and our understanding of the world. We make deductions, the leaves are fall falling, therefore it, it must be fall. Um, we could also say, well, it's not the fall, it's spring and if the leaves are falling, we can infer that there's something wrong with the tree. So, so humans have a very um, intricate way of learning. Now, machine learning is very important discipline in computer science and statistics and psychology, and it goes hand in hand with a cognitive computing approach. We are talking about algorithms that learn and improve the performance based on how these patterns of, of data um, are understood rather than explicitly programming uh, a, a system. So there are different approaches to machine learning and we could spend hours and hours. There are, you know, probably thousands of books that, that look at, at, uh, at these areas of, of how machines actually learn. But I'll give you sort of a, an idea of what this is about. So supervised learning is the idea that I'm coming up with a hypothesis. I sort of know what I'm looking for. For, for example, uh, let's say you're looking for spam in, uh, in a set of data on a system. Well, I know that I am looking to detect people that are coming into my system that don't, that, that don't seem to be acting like a regular uh, customer. And, and so that I'm going to, to start with the type of data I know about people who spam, and then I'm going to look to match the pattern of people coming into my system every day to see if I can determine uh, somebody who's trying to uh, get into my system in an unauthorized way. So I'm discovering patterns in huge amounts of data. Now, there are times when I don't really know what I'm looking for, so I'm doing drug discovery. So I, I can't say exactly which data is, is, is going to give me the answer. Maybe I'm doing a security system where I want to be able to look at hundreds and thousands of faces and pick out certain individuals. This is called unsupervised learning because I, I'm going to have a much larger data set and I'm not sure exactly what the answers are going to be or what patterns I'm looking for. Now, when, as people begin to get feedback and begin to learn and answer, this is where they get reinforcement learning. So it's as though you're playing a game and you make deductions um, based on a set of, a set of rules. Um, many of you have probably heard of uh, the Watson technology from IBM. And they uh, applied, uh, so the original experiment they used to to uh, test out this concept of a cognitive uh, computing system was, was when they um, uh, created the game of, of Jeopardy using the, the Watson technology. So if, so if we think about this, we have, we have supervised systems that are taught to detect a pattern. We have systems that, that learn and develop strategies based on performance feedback reinforcement. And we have unsupervised uh, learning that discovers patterns based on experience. So deep learning is a, another model within the area of machine learning that's intended to solve very complex problems by using layers of abstraction and parallelism from that comes out of very sophisticated hardware and, and many of these are within are, are using the uh, uh, sophisticated clouds to begin to to actually mimic the way the brain functions and processes data. And it's been uh, there are many emerging applications that are trying to take very complex data, analyze them at huge rates of speed. Now, one of the key areas, and we'll we'll get to that a little later are areas like security, like drug, drug discovery, and taking huge amounts of data that we, we have stored about things like different treatments um, in the medical 
um, industry, and they're uh, applying this uh, to using deep learning. So, but just a second, let's take a step back and 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 think about how how we as humans sense and understand data. We see things, we hear, we smell, we taste, and we touch. All of these are are the things that humans just take for granted. So when we think about this, a lot of the uh, the data that 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 we use to to do all these these uh, various um, uh, techniques that we take for granted are not in structured databases. So this is a big change. We're looking at text. We're looking at images. We're listening. We're looking at music cues, ev even smell, uh, temperature, how we touch things, the information coming off sensors. All of these are are part of the the data structures that that really become important within a cognitive model. Now this is a very busy slide, and uh, as I said, we could spend hours talking about this area because it's it really is becoming a codified method of of managing data. So obviously, we we have to have some sort of infrastructure that supports all this and manages all this, and this is where we get um, a lot of cloud technology, a lot of data storage, a lot of um, uh, those type of capabilities. On top of that, so so many of those data sources will come from lots of different places. They will come from external sources, whether it's video, images, sensors, um, uh, text, many different sources. And then, of course, structured internal sources. There has to be a way to extract the meaning of that, what's the meaning of the information in all these sources. Then we apply things like deep learning, natural language processing, um, to this. Uh, then you actually, in, in order to create one of these systems, you actually have the idea of a corpus. This, this is bringing the data together, um, cataloging it, um, uh, applying it to, to a specific um, uh, area. So what, what, it, what, is this, what is the relationship of, of uh, patients to diseases, to literature, to doctors, to hospitals? So, so you actually have to, in a sense, recreate a world through, through this technology. And then, of course, predictive analytics uh, becomes a very important part of this. How do you predict what you're getting, the information you're getting from the data? How do you then prescribe what the outcomes and the next steps should be based on what that data is telling you? And then what's very important to a cognitive system is that it's not static. You, you have a model and then you generate a hypothesis. This is what I think um, is the most important thing here. And then you test it and you see, does that hypothesis, is that borne out by the data I have? And it's, and it's, it's really a continuous machine learning process. And then you create applications and, and you learn to, to leverage these um, to, to move forward in whatever industry you're interested in. So how, how are we actually seeing uh, this being up, uh, applied? Well, there are many industries, as you can see from, from this list. Healthcare is really taking the lead here, and, and I'll tell you why I think this is. And I've heard the figures ranging from 100,000 to as much as a million different journal articles, um, results from clinical trials, lots and lots of data that's been created in this industry. Now, um, it's, it's possible that a, a doctor who's treating a patient with, with some curious symptoms may have some experience, the most experienced doctor in the world, may be able to, to walk in a room, look at a patient for five minutes and know what the exact diagnosis is. But that's the most experienced professional out there. What if you have a doctor who's been practicing medicine for a year. They are not going to have the deep knowledge and understanding of the literature, and they don't have the experience that um, that the that uh, professional who's been at it for 30 years may have. So what if there were a way to capture that data, 
um, convert it into, into a, a dynamic corpus of data that, that is a collaboration between human experts and the data to begin to, to offer um, less experienced practitioners answers to complex problems. So that's really what we're talking about and really to be able to learn you know, what the literature is telling us today that didn't tell us six months ago. And you can really see how this could be applied to for us, a city, for, for example, where in, in, in order to, to, uh, to manage traffic within a big city based on knowledge from where accidents are happening, needing to reroute traffic when, when there's an incident or a major event. So we, we, could, we could spend um, hours just looking at what's happening in different industries where a cognitive approach that really learning from all the data can really have an impact on how well you can service your customers and learn from the data. And there's, if there's one thing that is certain, we have no lack of data in, in, in the world. So, so what this, this is a new and emerging area. So uh, it's not one where, where um, it's is the primary way we we um, manage data, but it is starting to change. So if if we think about this in terms of a maturity curve, we sort of are, are starting off today with really a, a document centric approach. Um, we we go and we read an article. In, in a medical journal to try to find an answer. We search for an answer in a, in, in a um, search engine. But as, as we begin to mature, as we have move from silos of information and data to beginning to share data across these environments, and then to actually begin to create models based on data, based on uh, sources that are sort of starting to come together so we learn we predict and we move forward. So, so that's really what we're talking about. And it's going to take a number of years before this becomes the standard way we, we manage systems, but, but this is really where we're headed. So th this is not necessarily the easiest thing to do. So I, I, I don't want to leave you with the idea that you can go to um, a, a local um, distributor of computer software and, said, and say, you know, hand me a cognitive system. What we will get to in the future is that there will be domains, and we're already starting to see that, where, where software companies are beginning to build solutions based on solving a very specific uh, problem in, in their industry, whether it's transportation, uh, whether it is retail, finance, whatever, uh, or, or security, for example. But, but um, what many organizations are starting to do is they're, they're starting with a specific problem, an area where they have a lot of data, where, where they, they want to be able to move forward and solve problems that in the past have not been easily solved, and that where you really need a domain expert, somebody who's had those 30 or 40 years of experience to, to really have, um, have an understanding. So we have we talked earlier about these different models. So you would use, for example, a supervised learning approach when you know the key attributes of, of what you're trying to get to. You know the, the sources of data that you want to train. Now, you may have uh, an industry where, where um, you want to, where you're more interested in the results and you do you apply uh, reinforcement learning, and of course, unsupervised learning. I just want to take everything I can find out about the human genome and begin to to understand patterns. You know what what um, what is the affinity between a, a molecule and a potential uh, uh, solution to a, a cancer that has not been addressed in the past. So. It's very important then to identify what are the data sources that can help me. And then in the end, as this industry evolves and changes, which it will, we'll begin to see companies that are actually able to buy a platform or to, to buy a cloud service that addresses specific uh, 
industry issues. So if, if we really look at the life cycle of, of knowledge management, because in the end, this is about big data. This, this is about looking at, uh, at knowledge and how knowledge is, is evolved through the, through the whole notion of, of learning. So we really, the, the baseline is, is we feed data in and we generate a hypothesis. This really means that, okay, what do I assume that I'm going to get out of, of bringing all of this data, structured and unstructured data into play? So I generate a hypothesis. Then I say, okay, if I'm going to figure out what is the best way to treat um, a, a, a certain disease, let's say, um, I am then going to look at, okay, what data sources are out there that's going to, to help me to identify uh, potential uh, treatments. So I'll find many different sources of information and I'll bring those sources in. We call this ingestion. So I'll ingest data and these data sets can be huge. Now, once I get this data, the refinement process takes place. And one of the things I've, I've always said about data, big data is actually not about big data, it's actually about small data. So what we're really looking for is the ability to take a massive amount of data and refine it to get those patterns, to, to find those um, uh, anomalies and begin to, to then refine it to the elements of data that really matter. Now there's the training process. So once I've, I've re refined this, now I need to train the system. So training means that I've refined it and now I want to see, is the data set that I've come up with, is this actually helping me? So this is where an expert in an industry may look at the system, they might ask questions and see what answers that system comes up with. And it may be that, um, that the answers that the system comes up with, they're, they're, not, they're not good, they're, they're not helping. So then the feedback that that expert gives to the system will then be taken, that's where the, the machine learning really begins. So, so now the system is trained, I see I was going off in the wrong direction, let me refine the way I'm analyzing this data. And it may go back and look for new patterns, data that it might have ignored earlier, it begins to look at. So it's very much an iterative process. So once that training happens, then, then I begin to operate the system. Now, one of the things that, that we've seen beginning to happen is that companies who are uh, getting into this market will, will pre-train a set of data so so that when you're uh, trying to uh, create a cognitive system, you're not f starting from scratch. You have preset, pre-trained uh, data sets, but of course you will, as, as the system grows and changes, you will identify, the system will identify new anomalies, new patterns, and will start to, to refine itself. It may lead to generating a new hypothesis based on what the new data is telling me. You know, something else is happening here. I'm going to actually change my hypothesis or generate a new one. And then the process begins again. So as you see, we're talking about a field that is not static. It is absolutely dynamic, which, which really makes it so much different than the traditional uh, system because now we're beginning to have a system that is directing and learning from the data. It is not based on the assumptions that we've made about the world in, in the past. So, so companies are beginning to experiment. We're, we're seeing, uh, seeing a lot of healthcare companies, uh, uh, big um, hospitals, um, pharmaceutical industry leaders, uh, companies in financial services, in retail, um, really uh, in, in travel, um, across many industries, 
that, that are beginning to experiment. Because think about this. If you are able to take everything you know about customers, everything you know about your industry and changes and new research, and begin to identify that data and learn from it and, and move much faster and see patterns before any of your competitors see it, it really opens up an opportunity to think differently and to come up with different uh, solutions and identify and discover um, ideas and hypotheses that, that were hidden before. So it's, it's coming up with it, what could you do and what approach could you take that would absolutely transform your industry or would allow your company to perhaps leapfrog new competitors coming out of nowhere. So identifying those data, what are the data sources out there that maybe I use from time to time, but there are too many of them, there's too much data that I really can't move forward. And then defining a hypothesis. What is my theory? What is my assumption about how I cure cancer? or how I, I get more customers to, to, um, to buy my services, or how I anticipate a failure and make a correction before it is able to, to cause me problems in the market. And then train and test, and then determine, am I getting the type of results that are really allowing to me to move forward? So maybe I don't have enough data. Maybe, maybe I need to introduce new data sources that I never assumed I needed in the past. So we are really, as I said um, in the beginning of this presentation, we are really beginning to shift away from traditional programming paradigms. They simply can't keep up with the pace of data creation that is happening all around us. We are seeing that with this type of technology and with the introduction of machine learning, we're not, we're, we're not talking about things that are coming out of nowhere. We're talking about the data and the information that humans are creating through their research, through their knowledge, through their experience. And we're making them applicable and we're helping to really change the way companies interact with customers how they really begin to understand on a much deeper level. What do customers really want? What are the problems they're having? What can I do for customers as, as I move forward to, to really uh, create an environment where not only will they be happy with me, but they will stay with me and they'll buy more products and services. So it really is a, a way of connecting technology to people to knowledge. Um, at this point, um, I, I have another uh, polling question for you. And uh, Jeff, if you, if you could uh, bring that up. Um, so if, if you just have a second to sort of, you know, based on what we've been talking about, how do you think cognitive computing might be able to impact the industry that you are a part of? Uh, and uh, we'll uh, we'll collect these answers, and they will be available uh, on the replay. But you know, are is are there data sources? Is there information within the world that that you live in and work in that that you might be able to think about differently, think about non programmatically, but to really leverage that data to to transform what what you're doing. So we have a couple of answers. Faster analysis of investments, absolutely. Um, fact versus gut. I think I think that's a really good point because many times we we have biases and assumptions about how we make decisions, what our customers want, what outcomes we can expect, and that might not be borne out by the data. So one of one of the things that that is very critical with cognitive computing is to be able to separate out our biases, our assumptions about the world with what the data is really telling us. So these are all uh, really great, um, great um, uh, answers here. Compensate for the lack of experience. You know, how, how can you take the experience and understanding 
of somebody who's been in an industry for 20 years and have the person who's brand new who will be the next generation of leaders to take advantage of, of, of deep knowledge and experience uh, out there in the market. Uh, so I, I think all of these are, are, are excellent. Now, uh, somebody here mentioned um, higher education. One way, uh, there are some, um, I, I can't remember which hospital, it might be Sloan Kettering, but I could be wrong there. One of the hospitals using a cognitive system to try to uh, to train um, medical students on, on techniques um, and from the, some of the ex exams that they take to gain proficiency. Uh, so, so all of these are really uh, uh, great, uh, great comments and uh, we're very uh, pleased to, to see uh, your thoughts of, uh, around this. Um, I think we have a few more minutes and I can take some some. We have any questions coming in? Great, thanks, Judith. Yeah, we do have a, a few questions coming in, uh, and I would remind everybody. Uh, many of you had some great comments on that short answer there. Uh, feel free to to use the Q and A chat box at the bottom of your screen and type them in the question. Judith, I'm going to invoke the host privilege here and and jump into the front of the line with a question or two of my own. As as you're going through your presentation, you mentioned. Um, uh, computer systems that are sort of uh, utilizing f uh, photographs of faces for learning purposes. And that automatically made me think of Facebook. And I don't want to dumb this down too much, but you know, the fact that when I upload a, a photo of myself to Facebook and, and Facebook realizes that it's me before I put my name on it, is that an example of, of cognitive computing? Well, actually, um, that's interesting that you mentioned that. Companies like Facebook and Google and you know, um, uh, thousands of others are, are definitely using uh, machine learning techniques to get smarter ab about the images that are on these systems. So yes, Facebook is using machine learning to identify features and doing pattern recognition. Um, if you think about it, a face is, is a, a series of, of, uh, of data points. Mm -hmm. So um, so what what is uh, machine learning system is really doing is they're looking they're looking at the edges so the edges of a face the edges of a nose of eyes and 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 if you can match the patterns in in those images you can begin to um, distinguish one face from another so yes that and and it's also uh, being applied to um, uh, security systems in an airport. Where you want to, you know, you're looking for a suspicious person who might be traveling, and if you can, you'll know, compare using facial recognition to 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 make sure that uh, that you're identifying somebody who you're looking for. Great, thanks. Um, Cynthia has has typed in with a really interesting question. She says that mistakes can lead to great discoveries and avenues of thought. How do we not lose that with cognitive computing? Um, I, I, I actually think that you don't lo lose the mistakes because, in, fa in, in, in fact, uh, machine, machine learning will pick those up. It, and so it's going to see that as an anomaly. So, so a as I mentioned in, in, the, you know, way, in the beginning of this presentation, this is not about a machine going off and operating in isolation. It's the human that can you know, that looks at the answers and looks at the conclusions that the system comes to and says, no, that's wrong. Well, why is that wrong? So, so you're not, you know, these the systems don't live in isolation. They are actually looking for pattern. And in a sense, what they can do is, is actually indicate anomalies, which, you know, maybe an anomaly would be equivalent to a mistake. So, so I, I believe that a cognitive system will make it easier and faster to identify those mistakes that then lead to new learning. 
Great, fantastic. Um, got some great questions coming in. Uh, for those of you who are chiming in, do me a favor and try to keep them a little bit short, maybe to one sentence or a quick one so that we don't have really long questions here. Um, Armin has asked a really interesting question, Judith. He wants to know, uh, what skill sets do you believe are critical uh, for those of us who want to participate you know, in, in this cognitive computing revolution? Well, I think there there are a lot of different skills. It depends what side you're on. I mean, there's a role for data scientists because creating this this corpus of data um, it, it requires um, a very sophisticated understanding of of data, of of uh, machine learning, of deep learning. Of um, it also requires deep understanding. Of, of different industries, of data sources. I mean, data also has to be mapped. I mean, you can take a hundred different data sources and and assume that they are all based on the same, uh, um, have the same definitions of, of uh, different factors, and in fact, they're not. So you have to understand, is the data accurate? Is the metadata in sync? So, so there are a lot. There are so many different aspects to this um, that that uh, that is is actually quite far-reaching. That um, you can uh, uh, approach this from knowledge of an industry, knowledge of computer science. Um, so it's 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 pretty broad. Um, uh, the the areas that that are important here, and and I like to think of this area of cognitive computing as really. It's it's really an industry that is not uh, single faceted. It's multifaceted. It brings in so much, so many elements of computing, whether it's distributed computing, cloud, big data, analytics, um, uh, data management, data cleansing, um, um, analytics. Uh, knowledge of of industries and data. So it it really is is it really is going to change the very nature of what we think about as computing. Doug has uh, chimed in with a really interesting question. He's wondering how and where government stands on cognitive computing. A lot of the applications that you've mentioned, you know, security, healthcare, are really businesses that are, you know, motivated by profit. But can you give us any examples of how, you know, government or nonprofits are using this to, you know, solve problems like climate change, disease prevention? Uh, you know, what, what are they doing with socioeconomic data to drive better spending? Well, I, and, and I think, you know, again, keep in mind that, that this is early, but a, there's a lot of work going on. It, you know, the whole idea of, of, you know, if we think about smarter cities, what is a smarter city? It's a smarter city. It, it looks, looks at everything going on um, around us and looking at temperature, looking at um, natural disasters, uh, being able to, to take the massive amount of climate data and begin, begin to model that and learn over time. So there are a lot of experiments going on really across all industries, profit, nonprofit, government, that, that are starting to really, we have the data. Um, we have sensors everywhere that's collecting data. So we don't lack data. What, what, what we do lack is, is the ability to really understand what we've got. So, so I think that it really is going to apply everywhere. Great. Uh, thank you, everybody who's been chiming in. We've got some really fantastic questions, and I'm glad we have a few minutes here. Judith, are you okay to keep going for a few more? Sure. Sure, I'm happy to. Perfect. Awesome. Uh, Rohit Ashva, I apologize if I said your name wrong, uh, asked a really great question. How is artificial intelligence different from cognitive computing? Are we talking about you know the eventual overthrow by the robots here? Well, I hope so, because I, I'd like to retire. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, actually, um, artificial machine learning is obviously related to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is, it, you know, it, when we talk about a continuum of technology. So in the 60s and 70s, when artificial intelligence came about, what we were trying to do is really mimic a lot of the capabilities of humans. But we didn't have... Technology wasn't mature enough. We didn't have the capability to, to really 
um, understand and, and manage huge amounts uh, of data. So it was early. And there were some really interesting early experiments, but it needed time. So in, in the beginning of the presentation, when I talked about the technologies have to go through a maturation cycle before they're ready to really be applied to, to problems in a ubiquitous way, artificial intelligence is, uh, you know, went through some very tough times when it couldn't deliver on its promises. And now what we see is a reemergence of the field of artificial intelligence in the form of cognitive computing and machine learning. But I don't believe we're going to see the robots taking over the world because in, in, in order to, re, to really uh, gain insights and to really use um, data to make decisions, it has to be a collaboration. It can't be simply, you know, let a machine go off because machines are only as smart as the data that we feed it and how we analyze the data. So. I don't see that happening. We have a couple of people who've um, chatted in with sort of similar questions, John being one of them. Um, questions sort of specifically about uh, the platform, the hardware, and the software. Can you What tools are being used to actually work on these kinds of cognitive computing um, projects now? Are there specific companies that you would highlight? Or, um, you know, if somebody really wanted to start using this in their company, who would they need to get in touch with? Well, uh, you know, some of the leaders in this, I mean, I, I, IBM has done um, a lot of work over the last uh, five or six years, um, and, and obviously much longer, to, and they're beginning to codify this within their uh, Watson technology. So I would take a look at that. There are a huge number of startups uh, that are just coming out of the woodwork um, that uh, you know Google is working on this, uh, Facebook, Amazon, all of these companies are investing a lot. A lot of, uh, of the work with this type of technology is happening behind the scenes. So, so it, it, it will impact the way you use, um, you use some of these systems, so some of it you won't see, but there are companies that start are, that are starting to, um, to commercialize this. And, and some of it's uh, you know, very early, but, but we are seeing, especially in, in healthcare, uh, companies like company Cognitive Scale out of North Carolina that's, uh, that's uh, creating um, solutions. Um, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're, I would say they're probably five or six hundred uh, companies at different stages uh, of maturation that are starting to to uh, create models. Many of the uh, emerging companies are also applying this type of technology in what's, what's being called Internet of Things. So this is more uh, machine to machine and human to machine uh, technology where they're taking massive amounts of real-time data from sensors and starting to apply machine learning to that. So it's a very dynamic field. Great. We've got six or seven people who have all asked great questions about how to apply cognitive computing to their specific field. Uh, Sujana, Paula, Renata, um, Sorina, a number of, of you have asked sort of a similar question about how, how does cognitive computing computing work on this, you know, X field. Judith, you've obviously made your email address available here on the screen. Yes. I know that you're a consultant and you get paid for your time, but I'm guessing that you'd be willing to have people contact you directly for those sort of application a questions. Absolutely, that, that, that would be fine. And also, in uh, I will make a, a plug for cognitive computing and big data analytics because we do have a whole section on the book that talks about how um, this cognitive technology is being applied now and in the future to many different industries. So we try to address that in the book. Um, um, uh, writing a book as an industry is changing is, is not the easiest thing in the world, but, uh, but that's what we try to do. Awesome. Well, thanks for making yourself available. I was also going to plug your book as, as an answer to that question. But some uh, two more interesting ones I want to get to. Um, uh, Michelle asked an interesting question. Can can you apply cognitive computing principles to small samples of data, or does it really need to be truly big, massive amounts of data? Well, I think if you have a very small amount of data, I'm not sure you'd really need a cognitive system. And you know, it depends. Depends. You know, 
it depends what you mean by small. Um, you know, in a in in many cognitive systems, you're talking about a lot of unstructured data. So it really depends on what you mean by small data. Um, if it's if it's small enough, you can probably, as an individual, ingest that or or uh, put it into, you know, a small uh, data management engine uh, to figure that out. So I think I think there is the, this construct of of uh, of a lot of data that is really not possible to understand it um, unless you apply some sort of learning technology. Great. Um, a great question from Kristen, who's interested in sort of, you know, learning more and keeping the conversation going. Judith, you're here in Needham outside of Boston. Um, can you recommend any sort of thought groups that might exist, professional associations that somebody might want to check out if this is a topic that really interests them and they want to learn more? Yeah, so I would, I would actually look on LinkedIn. There are actually a number of, uh, of, of conversations and uh, groups. I know that uh, that IBM has has, uh, has several different um, uh, LinkedIn groups that um, that are uh, addressing issues around cognitive. Um, uh, take take a look at uh, uh, Google has a lot of information online on uh, where, that they share uh, around cognitive computing. Um, so uh, and uh, and I know there there are some meetup groups uh, that that are um, as, that are uh, happen from time to time in this topic. There are conferences um, uh, that are out there. So, so they're beginning to be uh, more resources um, uh, available. Great. Well, Judith, this was fantastic. I, uh, I'm really glad we left so much time for questions as, as we obviously had some great ones come from the audience. So to all of you who participated, thank you. Uh, and Judith, thanks again for your time. I, I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all. It's been a great conversation. And again, my thanks go out to all of our guests for participating today. I hope that you'll plan to join us for our next BU Industry Insiders webinar. We're coming up in just a few weeks. On July 15th, alumna Buma Yandava will present a session called The Supply Chain of the Future. You can sign up for that session now on our website at bu.edu slash alumni. And as always, if you or any BU alumni you know would be interested in presenting a professional development webinar or have a topic that you'd like to showcase for the BU alumni community, please feel free to contact me directly at the Alumni Relations Office or you're welcome to email me at jtmurphy, that's J, uh, J as in Jeff, T as in Thomas Murphy at bu.edu. Thanks everybody for your time. Have a great day or a great evening wherever you might be. Take care. Thank you.